side of the Myanmar uh, originally was referred to as Burma uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, another country actually that there was a, an upheaval in the country. They renamed it Myanmar. It's still an argument in the UN what name you refer to it as. One is an insult and one is not. Um, currently, the United States refers to it as both. Sometimes uh, President Obama would refer to it as Myanmar. Sometimes it was Burma. Currently, we are referring to it as Myanmar. I'm not certain how long that will be. Probably depending on how well our our work goes with our with the diplomats. Um, Myanmar is a very old country. Um, it's part of a very old ancient civilization that's kind of moved and shifted. Myanmar was closed off for a little while for a lot of real deep exploration. Um, arguably, looking over it, you can pretty much break Myanmar into four different smaller groups that would be more focused. Um, a lot of us are more familiar with what would be the Lake Inlay. Lake Inlay is a very ancient lake inside of Myanmar. I tried to find information on how ancient, and apparently ancient is the only descriptor they like to use. So, it is ancient. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know how old it is. Um, it's ancient. It, but yes, no descriptor beyond that. Um, so I'm going to start there and then we'll kind of wander through the other different regions. Uh, Lake Inlay is in the Shan State. So it's over near, it's almost near where the S and H in Shan State, if you can see on this map. It's over in the eastern part of Shan State. So it's actually an almost central uh, central part of the country. It's about 2,700 feet above sea level. So it's, a, it's really high. Um, it was much larger even 50 years ago. Um, it's been being depleted because of a lot of de deforestation. It's unsettling dirt and it's coming down as silt. And it's filling in the lake. The lake is very, very shallow, ridiculously shallow. The average depth of the lake is seven feet. The deepest part of the lakes is a whopping 12 foot. Most Olympic pools are deeper than this lake. Um, there's not many rivers that flow into it or egress out. It's mostly smaller streams, so it doesn't have much of a current. Um, it's most famous for the fishermen. If you ever do a search, I will try to post a link. Um, it's some fishermen that like to, to uh, paddle with their feet. So they stand on the boat with one and they've got a huge bell trap. And it's a kind of simple people. Uh, a lot of tourists go there just for to watch these fishermen as they catch these fish with these bell traps. Uh, it's kind of an artistic thing. Uh, it's, it's got a certain humor to it. Yeah. Um, mostly these fish, they become isolated because it's such an old lake that many of the species there are endemic. They're only found there, nowhere else. Um, you've got a lot of saprinids, uh, which would be your danios, especially your oddball danios, your celestial pearl danio is endemic to the lake. The dwarf emerald grass borer, the Danio erythromicron, is from that lake. Uh, there is a lake inlay grass borer, which is arguably a Danio that's got its own kind of genus. It's it's a very long one. It's very big. I I would butcher its enunciation. It's like Insulinlipis rubra or something like It's really long. Um, they call it a Lake Inlay Rasbora. It looks almost like a Danio with barring that's vertical and it's very thin. It's got a real long thin body. Uh, it's currently just been CITES listed 
So getting them can be arguable. Um, especially non... Well, the, I think that what it is is we're starting to see tank raised or pawn bred. So we might see availability or they're mislabeling it because it's changed genus like four times. So it's really being hard to track exactly what you're talking about because it keeps jumping genus. Um, there is a lake inlay botia or like a hovering loach uh, that's kind of neat. It, it kind of flits and flirts around in the lake. There's a handful of catfish species. Um, most of them are bagrids. Uh, they generally don't do well in a lake inlay biotope because they're generally the predators of all those cute little fish. So if you add in that, it would be adding in the super predator that eats them all. Um, there's a handful of carp species. Um, not much beyond that. There's a large amount of invasive species inside of Lake Inlay um, that will probably continue to further drive down numbers, which is sad. Um, we do have a handful of betas that are found in that lake, uh, some of the smaller betas. Lake Inlay is arguably, in my opinion, one of the better biotope species for a nano for us to keep in this region. And that's because of water parameters. Their water is almost exactly ours. Exactly. Temp. Their average temp is our temp, especially inside of a house. Um, they usually hit about an 8.2 to an 8.4 pH. Their hardness is way up. So you keep those celestial pearl danios, and they're going to naturally want to breed. Whereas you keep something like ember tetras, you're going to have to drive down that pH to actually get them to trigger to spawn. And most of our, our nano species are Southeast Asia, you know, and African riverine or South American, all soft water regions. This is one of the few that are hard water, so it makes it a, a prime candidate for, for success, you know, keeping them locally. Um, let's see. I have huge lists of fish, but the second that I would actually argue out as, as a biotope, per se, I'm trying to remember the square, <laughs> um, is in the upper region. So you've got over here is Lake Inlay. And that would arguably be a, its own specific biotope. Um, up in this northern region of Kachin, this is mostly mountainous, hilly regions. So you've got very small, thin streams that are very cold and very highly oxygenated. It also has high, you know, hard, hard water from the mountainous regions. These are going to be Baltorid areas. So you're getting into hill stream loaches. Um, some, some schisturas, zipper loaches, uh, those sort of species. Um, a lot more danios, um, even the pearl danio hails from that region. Um, generally speaking, these are, you can also even get into some of the Beruleus, the royal trout danios, they also hail from there. A lot of those species aren't endemic to that region. They're shared by India and China as well. So the chances of finding panda loaches over here might be fairly significant. And thus, it doesn't make Myanmar the only place that that's found. It just, that whole region kind of is all inundated with small streams that cross. Um, and a lot of those fish is kind of evolved in that same region. Uh, occasionally you get some unique coloring the sumo loach, the, the Schistura species sumo, is the one with the red band around its center, like the sumo wrestler. That's where they get it. You know the sumo wrestler? That, yeah. Um, that one is actually found and collected there in, in northern uh, Myanmar. So whether that 
proves to be a unique species or just simply a geographic variant, we'll, we'll kind of see. Um, Logis.com is amazing for keeping up with a lot of that. Honestly, I've kind of given up on trying to keep up with what's a species and what's just a geographic variant. They, they're on top of their game. Um, the next large biotope region would be, it's hard to see in this, but literally all these rivers come down into the Ira, Irrawaddy. I, I hope I didn't pronounce, mispronounce that. Irrawaddy River System. Imagine this being arguably the Mississippi. The Mississippi uh, of Myanmar. All these rivers flow into it. So when you start getting into the rivering species, species you start getting more, um, the land is kind of sloping out, it's leveling off. You're gonna start seeing more of the humphead glass fish. Some of the Chan, uh, Chanda species, um, Indian glass fish. And there's a large amount of those little kind of glass perchlets that, that are fairly common in those regions. Um, you also get into clouded archers. Uh, that's Toxicoides blithy, which is our only known archer fish that is found entirely in fresh water. And it doesn't seem to actually push into even brackish. We don't find it in brackish, which is odd because most of the archers that we found all over are nominally brackish into full marine. So this is the only one. Um, you can recognize it by its clouded pattern. Some of the other archers can be really difficult to determine unless you know where they're collected. I mean, you start looking at the difference between a big scale archer and a small scale archer, and it, I will call Katie every day of the week, and she will start telling me scale counts, because, or wait till it grows up, if it grows to 12 inches, it's this. If it grows to 8 inches, it's that. Oftentimes, that's the only determining factor. But the, the clouded archers, or sometimes I'll call them golden or Myanmar yeah, archers. Golden now, but they also go zebra archers. Like, they've got a bunch of different names. Scientific's the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> but the Toxicoides blithe are good fish. They can be a little bit tricky to transition. Um, onto pellets. Pellets is the way to go. Uh, remember, these are insectivores in the wild. Feeding them crickets will be an easy transition for them. If they're being finicky, put live crickets in there, they will not have any problem. They will eat them. One of the best ways to train them is if you can buy crickets. You feed them crickets, the pellet food that you would normally be feeding the archer fish, because the crickets then will gut load with the cichlid food or the pellet food that you're using so they already have a taste for it so when you transition them it's significantly easier um Continue. let's see uh another of the oddballs that's found there in the irrawaddy river system uh very large fish somehow this escaped notice till 2003 they realized that there is a three-foot arowana that lives there Somehow we'd missed it. Until when? 2003. <laughs> and that is the the most recent of the arowanas that actually has been diagnosed. Um, oftentimes it's referred to as the Batik arowana or the Myanmar arowana. Now, prior to that, we kind of laugh and go, how did you miss uh, an arowana that's three foot living in this river? Surely somebody noticed it. Um, they did. They assumed that it was part of the uh, Asian arowana, like it was just simply a geographic variant. So basically it was, it's scler Sclerapages inscriptus. It is the most endangered of the arowanas. Um, because it was part of, assumed to be part of the Formosus group, which is the Asian arowana, and when it was broken out, it still falls under our Endangered Species Act because at one time it was assumed to be that. 
So it is illegal to own that fish. Uh, currently, there's so few in the wild that not even some of the Southeast Asian breeders have gotten enough of them to breed successfully. They have little designs on them. Yes. Scale. Yeah, if you've never seen one, they've got really gorgeous kind of mosaic patterns on the scales. Why they call it petite. Yeah. They are definitely beautiful fish. Um, this region is also heavily dominated uh, by <laughs> tor, uh, which is basically, imagine kind of a, a large uh, tinfoil bar. That sort of look. Um, Saprinids are the mainstay. Are, we have completely gone away from cichlids. There are no cichlids found natively in Myanmar. Yet yeah, none whatsoever. So, saprinids dominate the landscape. Uh, saprinids and saprinid relatives. So you're going to go into like some of the loaches, the tiger loaches, the cynocrosis, um, some of the botias. You get into uh, the Myanmar botias and the Burmese bo botias, the Burmese border loaches, the histrionica. Angelicus, those are fishes that dominate this region. Um, as far as upper water predators, it's kind of, most of them don't generally get into the hobby. They're large kind of silver gray catfish that just kind of eat everything. Um, some of the gooches are found in Myanmar, especially in the northern region. Uh, the gooch. Gooch. Never heard. Yeah, you never watch River Monsters? Uh, yeah. That's what they call them. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, so, generally, catfish are your top predators. You've got some arowanas that would be arguably predatory. Um, there are a handful of rice fish that are also found in the region. So the Orzwari, is that the rice fish genus? Uh, I think so. I think, think that's genus. Uh, those are found in, inside of that region. Uh, there's a handful of different catfish from different families uh but most of them don't see we don't see in the hobby very often uh some of the you guys are killing me. it's okay <laughs> it is all right um let me double check arguably the largest of the predators that really has taken that cichlid domain would be the Chanas. And we don't see them over here because they're illegal in all 50 states, but those are the snakeheads. Oh. Snakeheads dominate that region for that top level predator. Um, very little can compete with them. We do see gouramis, uh, snake skin, actually hail from this region, as well as honey gouramis. Uh, a lot of the walking perch also come from this region uh that's kind of the general uh fish found in that that so an irrawaddy tank would really be a large rivering tank these are large a large deep river that shares that higher ph and would be dominated it'd basically be a very large tank that lacks cichlids that would be heavily dominated by saprinids you know carps uh that sort of kind of relative group some of the leptobarbus, the redfin cigar sharks, that sort of thing. Um, the fourth biotope that I would argue would be the mouth of the Irrawaddy region, which is basically, you can see it's a finger delta where all the Irrawaddy comes and basically drains out into the Bay of Bengal here. And this is going to be mangrove forest. So you're going to see a large amount of brackish fish. 
So the Monos hail from this region, uh, the Argentius, and the Scats. Now, that would be the spotted scat, right? Well, depends which spot. You have your reds and the green. Well, the greens are from this region, right? The greens are, but the reds are generally found closely with them. Okay. Yeah. I'm not but certain. They look identical, I've heard, so it doesn't matter. Right. They're so, um, also, you've got a large amount of uh, the different chanas, the uh, Indian glassfish group, the perchlets, that also dominate that region along with a large amount of gobies. Um, these are also going to be regions where you're going to find some of the bumblebee gobies. All the little uh, tiny bumblebee gobies are all kind of that region, along with a large amount of sleepers that we just don't see. Sleeper gobies are just kind of large, mean, aggressive. Um, crocodiles also inhabit this region, so it, there's arguable the death rate of humans to crocodiles is fairly significant in this region. It's a fairly poor region. So a lot of these people are on like small handmade boats and these are large saltwater crocs. So yes, saltwater croc versus small handmade boat, the saltwater croc wins. Um, it's one of the few regions other than in the Philippines and you know in Indonesia where you see large like deaths to crocodiles like it, in most other developed areas you just don't see it um the only fifth biotope i would say inside of myanmar would be a bay of bengal tank and there's a large amount of reefs that occur right off the out in that region now i would love to say that that was a strong suit and i studied the bay of bengal but i did not the reefs do look impressive. Um, I definitely recommend looking into it. Uh, you know, they share a lot of Southeast Asian kind of Southeast Pacific sort of species. But remember that arguably we are still out in this Bay of Bengal here. We're still in the Indian Ocean. We haven't actually gone into the Pacific. So it's kind of a slice of the Pacific inside of the Indian Ocean. Because really, those reefs don't realize that it jumped into a different ocean. They didn't get the memo. They just kind of, the currents kind of go this way. Um, other than that, I think that that is really about it. Uh, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, critiques? It was wonderful.